So welcome high school teachers. This is our professional development course, Archimedes and the Law of the Lever. I'm Norman Wahlberger. We're here at the University of New South Wales, the School of Mathematics and Statistics. In this course, we're going to be looking at some ideas that, although they go back to the ancient Greeks, they actually have a lot of application to the modern world. So going back to Archimedes, who introduced this famous Law of the Lever, and how we understand the relative moments of balancing objects it leads to the idea of the center of mass and barycentric coordinates and connects very closely with vector ideas from linear algebra as well. And in fact also, as we'll see, to some ideas from elementary statistics involving expected values. All right, so in our first module uh, today, we're going to look at levers and centers of mass. All right, so what is a lever? Well, a lever is a rigid rod that pivots around one point to move a load at a second point by applying a force at a third point. And there are a number of different configurations that uh, are distinguished by the relative positions of these three points. So the pivot uh, point is often called the fulcrum and denoted by this little triangle here. And the load here is this box, which is some kind of mass, and the force is represented by this arrow. So the class one lever, which is perhaps uh, the most familiar, is where we're trying to lift a load, and we do that by getting a bar and finding a place to pivot the bar, and then applying a force on the other side of the lever. So in this case, the fulcrum is between the load and the force. And there are a number of uh, familiar kinds of examples of a class one lever, including, well, a crowbar, but also the oars on a boat, which, uh, for which the, the lock uh, is the fulcrum. A catapult, also going back to the ancient world, is an example of such a situation, as is a pair of regular scissors. With a class two lever, we have the fulcrum on one side and the load in between the fulcrum and the force. And the standard example of that is a wheelbarrow. But a crowbar can also be used in this fashion. And if you think about it, a door is really a kind of example of such a lever as well. A class three lever has also the fulcrum on one uh, end, but now the force is in between the fulcrum and the load. A pair of tweezers is a class three lever, as is a broom or a hockey stick. And in Australia, sheep shearing scissors are also of this form. So these are the three basic classes of levers. And it's actually fun for high school students to come up with other examples of familiar or maybe not so familiar technical objects in the modern world that are levers that fall into one of these kinds. Now, when we want to understand these things a little bit more carefully, we want to understand the numerical relationships between the loads and the forces required and that depend on the relative positions of these three points. That was all worked out more than 2,000 years ago by the greatest scientific mind of the ancient world, Archimedes, and it's called the Law of the Lever. Archimedes was born and lived in Syracuse, which was a prominent city in Sicily around this time, 287 to 212 BC. This was a time before the Romans had actually extended their reach into Sicily. So Syracuse was an independent uh, city-state. And he was a very prominent uh, scientist, mathematician, engineer, inventor. And uh, he was responsible for a lot of interesting things, including arguably the development of the calculus. And he made some very important calculations involving volumes, studied curves like spirals and others. He devised war machines and uh, irrigation screws. But what we're going to be interested in mostly today is his law of the lever. So people had thought about the lever before Archimedes. In fact, Aristotle had a theory, a kinetic theory of why the lever works. But Archimedes came up with a relatively simple a reason for this fundamental law that explains when you have balance 
between two possibly different masses on different sides of a fulcrum. This is the essential formula that controls uh, the, uh, the story of the Lieber. So here's a fulcrum, and we have a mass M1 on this side, the mass M2 on this side. And uh, here, the separation between the fulcrum and the mass M1 is D1. And here, this length is D2. And the law of the lever says that these balance precisely when M1, D1 equals M2, D2. Now, these quantities, the product of the force times the distance, are sometimes called moments. So that's a physical term. So we can say that balance occurs when the moments are equal and in opposite directions. So why is it true? Well, Archimedes had an argument for why it was true, and it was roughly the following. So imagine a simpler situation where we have three equal masses which are symmetrically placed on a lever, which is an equal length on both sides. So they're going to balance by symmetry. It's clear that there's the situation is symmetrical, so they're going to, it's going to balance. And now Archimedes says, all right, just imagine if we modify this a little bit by taking these two masses and raising them on a separate little platform, which is uh, suspended over the original bar at the midpoint uh, between them. Okay. So we actually haven't changed the positions of the masses along the, the lever itself. We've just changed where the forces are being applied. Archimedes argues that in this case things will still balance because essentially we haven't moved any of the masses. But the effect of these two masses together at this point here is really the same as if we had stacked two masses M at that midpoint. Okay? And then if you think about it, well this is the midpoint uh, of that segment there, so that we must have the ratio uh, 1 to 2 here. Okay? And that's establishing the fact that we have an equilibrium because this mass times this distance, which is 2M, is the same as the product of this mass, 2m, times this distance, which is 1. Now there's another way of thinking about this that I want to uh, tell you about, which is a vector point of view. Okay, with a vector point of view, we introduce a vector that's emanating from the fulcrum in this direction, let's call it v1, and another vector which emanates in this direction, let's call it v2, and we'll make them vectors, so I'll denote vectors like this. So that's a directed line segment. So another way of stating this is to say that m1 times v1 plus m2 times v2 equals 0. That's the same because v1 and v2 are in different directions. So the total moment, which is the combination of masses times displacement vectors, has to equal 0 in order to have balance. This is a modern vector way of writing this ancient Greek formula here found by Archimedes. Archimedes' law of the lever has many generalizations, very important ones. And a simple generalization is what happens when we have more than two masses on a lever. There's a natural generalization. Here, for example, we have three masses, five, mass of five at the point minus two, mass of two at the point one, a mass of 4 at the point 2. And if we imagine that the actual lever itself, the axis that we're on, is weightless, doesn't really contribute at all, then the point of balance will be the origin. How can we see that? Well, if we use the vector form, which is a very nice, flexible way of thinking about the center of mass, then the vectors that are emanating from the origin to these three positions are the vector v1, which we can write as minus 2, the vector v2, which is the vector 1, and the vector v3, which is the vector 2. And now if we take m1 times v1 plus m2 times v2 plus m3 times v3, we get 5 times minus 2 plus 2 times 1 plus 4 times 2, which is a total of 0. And so that balance equation is satisfied and this point here really is the point of balance of these three masses. Now this balance point is usually called the center of mass of the three masses. 
And here's another example where we have three masses in positions that are known, but we don't know where the center of mass is. So let's see if we can calculate it. Let's suppose that the center of mass is at some position C, which is currently unknown to us. How could we figure out what C is? Well, we have to take the various moments of these three masses around the unknown point C and hopefully set that equal to zero. All right, so let's calculate the moments here. So the first mass of five, we have to multiply it by the vector that's going from C to one. That's the vector one minus C. The second mass of three is multiplied by the vector from three to C, which is three minus C. And the final mass of two is multiplied by the vector six minus C. And all together, that should equal zero if we have balance. Well, that's the equation five plus nine plus 12 minus five C minus three C minus two C equals zero. And so five plus nine plus 12, that's 14 plus 12, that's 26 minus a total of 10 C equals zero. So C equals 26 over 10, or if we like, 13 over five. That's then the position of the point where these three masses balance. That's the center of mass. And it's somewhere just a little bit less than three. In general, this, exactly this kind of reasoning allows us to deduce this theorem. Very important theorem that says that if you have masses m1, m2 up to mk at positions r1, r2 up to rk, then the center of mass of that configuration is this point C. It's 1 over capital M times M1 R1 plus M2 R2 all the way up to MK RK, where capital M is the sum of the masses. So if we had used that formula in this case here, we would have had to uh, take 1 over capital M, the sum of the masses would be 10, and this sum here would have been 5 times 1 plus 3 times 3 plus 6 times 2. And that would have totaled 26 over 10. In our next module, we're going to have a look at extending Archimedes' law of the lever to a planar situation where a lot more interesting things happen as well.